yeah so just felt like sharing that you know about our hearing that uh, god is a god who speaks and he wants us to hear clearly so that we might our actions will also be clear right when we hear clearly when we know clearly then our uh, our decisions our walk will be um, you know sure and it won't be hesitant right uh, and we will be people of faith because faith comes by hearing the word of god right so uh, whatever the word he quickens to our heart faith comes by that and uh, we have the privilege of hearing the now now in the word of god um the rema of god so um that produces faith in us and also the rema word of god is also the weapon the sword of the spirit so it's it's very important that we hear clearly right and also um whenever we feel that okay lord i'm not able to hear clearly you know in the spirit there seems to be some things that are blocking some things that are creating confusion it's best to just seek him and say lord what is it you know what is it that's uh, thing is it something that's uh, that i'm doing is it some habit is it some my attitude uh, and just seek him and say god you know i i just want it removed out of my life i want that i don't want anything to come between um, you know me and hearing you uh, clearly right so um, that's something that we we can pursue to pursue the voice of god to pursue hearing him um, you know that's because that's our privilege right okay okay let's uh let's turn let's turn to corinthians and uh, what we've been studying so far okay um so we looked uh, we were studying um, last class we looked at chapter 7 right and chapter 7 we didn't finish chapter 7 uh i think we went up to verse 20 uh verse 23 i think right or verse 24 Okay, so verse twenty-four. So uh, interesting. Um, Paul writing about uh, writing to the Corinthian church very specifically about uh, marriage, about uh, you know uh, uh, sexual relationship within marriage, uh, and uh, and very clearly, you know, he's he's laying down certain certain instructions. Uh, if a person is married already, and then they come to the Lord, right? So the Because so the situation is like people, they don't know the Lord. Now they get married, they become believers, and, and one one of them, like one of them, becomes a believer. The other person is still not a believer, and uh, they and then you know challenges that arise out of that. So he addresses that. What if one person wants to leave? You know, person saying, you know, you're a believer. I don't, you know, I don't want to live with you anymore. Uh, and you know, so. Um, so he's saying you know just continue to uh, be reconciled right uh, continue to live uh, together but then if the if that person wants to leave and go then like you don't have a choice right so let that person go but you stay you know you do your best to stay in that in the relationship um, and so on so and uh, and then he talks about um 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 i think we looked at verses 20, 17 to 24 right um saying you know if you are called uh, like when you are called you know to remain in that uh, in that um oh, what is the word he uses um remain in that calling is what he uh, what he says but the context is marriage and or uh you know social status and all that right he's saying uh, verse 20 right chapter 7 and verse 20 let each one remain in the same calling in which he was called and of course he's talking about being married unmarried and so on so the thing is if if you are married then you know don't say uh you know i wish i you know i was not married then i would serve the lord better or if you're not married just you know don't keep complaining saying you know i wish i was married then i could serve the lord better or you know i could be a better christian you know in that way so um don't worry about that right uh, serve the lord in whatever way you are and also about you know uh, he's talking about being a slave and freed man and and so on right um, so that's how he start uh, finishes that uh, that that thought uh, in verse 24 that then let each one remain with god in that state in which he was called so uh, so that's the context of that right uh, of that verse uh, and these verses say uh, like uh, verse 24 and also verse 20 now let's look at uh, verse 25 onwards <clears throat> okay let me just read a uh, 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 
happens um, as one whom the Lord in his mercy has made trustworthy. I suppose, therefore, that this is good because of the present distress, that it is good for a man to remain as he is. Are you bound to a wife? Do not seek to be loosed. Are you loosed from a wife? Do not seek a wife. Um, but even if you do marry, you have not sinned. And if a virgin marries, she has not sinned. Nevertheless, such will have trouble in the flesh, but I would spare you. For, for, but this I say, brethren, the time is short, so that from now on, even those who have wives should be as though they had none, and those who weep as though they did not weep, those who rejoice as though they did not rejoice, those who buy as though they did not possess, and those who use this world as not misusing it, for the form of this world is passing away. Uh, but I want you to be without care. He who is married cares for the things, unmarried cares for the things of the Lord, and how he may please the Lord. But he who is married cares about the things of the world, how he may please his wife, um, and so on. Like, uh, uh, yeah, verse 34, there is a difference between a wife and a virgin. The unmarried woman cares about the things of the Lord, uh, that she may be holy both in body and in spirit. But she who is married cares about the things of the world, how she may please her husband. Um, but this I say for your own profit, not that I may put a leash on you, but for what is proper that you may serve the Lord without distraction. Okay, verse, verse 35. Okay, so this is what he says. Okay, now uh, he starts by saying, now concerning virgins, so people who are not married. Okay, uh, the word used there, Parthenos, it, it means... Um, uh, uh, people who are yet to get, get married, people who are of marriageable age, sorry, people who are of marriageable age, people who do not, who have uh, uh, not had a physical relationship in marriage. Um, so it could be, uh, uh, it could be a woman, it could be of either gender, right? Um, so he's speaking to uh, unmarried people right now. And he's uh, giving his recommendation. So notice how, what he says, you know, he says, I have no commandment but I give judgment. Okay, so look, you know, looking at what is uh, what is good, what is best, what is not good. I'm giving a judgment. So judgment is, you know, when you when you decide, when you when you pronounce uh, a decision based on what you have heard. Right, as a judge, you'd hear both sides of the story. You'll hear the good, you'll hear the bad, and uh, and then you give a decision right so so that is what judgment is so he's saying you know as one who um, uh, who is whom the lord has made uh, in his mercy he had made me trustworthy so as one um, as such a person i give judgment so he's saying it's it's not a commandment but i'm giving judgment okay um, so this also you know we can we, it is for us to uh, consider uh, with a lot of weightage, because it comes from a man who was used by the Lord. It comes from a person who was um, used by the Lord in powerful ways and was trusted by the Lord. And that's what he says, you know, made trustworthy in his mercy. So I'm giving this judgment. Okay, but but the but the wonderful thing is that he makes a di uh, difference between a commandment of the Lord and uh, a, a practical wisdom um, which comes from him, right? From all those years of ministry and uh, having been trusted by the Lord right so this is what he says you know I suppose this is good because of the present distress so he's talking about the present condition uh, probably you know the persecution of the church um, uh, and uh, troubles and everything that the, the, the believers the Christians were facing at those times the church was facing so so he's saying you know it, it is good if uh, you know if you're already married then don't seek to be you know separated but if you are not married, then you know you can choose to remain as you are, right? Is what he's saying, and it's not a sin. And even if um, you know a person who's of marriageable age marries, then uh, you know she has not sinned. You know the, the lady has not sinned. Okay, so this is this is what he says, verse twenty six. Nevertheless, he says such will have trouble in the flesh, but I would spare you. You know the, what is this trouble in the flesh? You know the, so. Uh, you know, does that mean that uh, something will happen to me physically just because I get married? And you know, is, is what what is he talking about? Right? If you um, remember, he talks about this this uh, thing about destruction of the flesh, right? And uh, where did he talk about it? He talked about it in uh, you know chapter uh, chapter five, 
right he's talked about that person who was uh, you know sexually uh, you know uh, um is immoral and he was part of the fellowship part of the church and then he says you know i pronounce judgment and uh, i hand him over to satan for the destruction of the flesh right uh, you, you remember that right and uh, what was that act of handing over it was you know like asking him not to be part of the fellowship because he was continuing in sin he was not uh, listening obviously to whatever correction right he was continuing to have that lifestyle and uh, and so 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 he he give you know he passes pronounces that kind of a judgment now he used the same usage here say so saying you will have trouble in the flesh so so flesh um, that word of course uh, um, um, it refers to a body physical body physical flesh right we are made up of flesh and bones so uh, flesh their greek word sarx uh, re- refers to that it also refers to a bodily appetites and it generally refers to human beings also you know because uh, uh, the lord says i will pour out my spirit on all flesh so what does it mean that that on all on all people right so it refers to people also um and also uh, you know it could refer to the carnal desires the fleshly appetites uh, the sinful appetites of the body okay so it has all these meanings so so saying you will have trouble in the flesh so you're just saying you know um you will have uh, responsibilities you will have uh, you will face pressures you know the pressures of marriage the pressures of daily life uh, uh, and so on so that is what he is referring to it's not like you know you will get some sickness or you know you will have some trouble in your body right uh, so understanding what uh, the context is or you know how he uses the word flesh so we we see that okay um and then he goes on to say that um, you know those who are married should be even though even as if they are not married and even those who are ma- unmarried should be as though they are you know remaining that way that that they may and then also about using the world he says you know those who are using the world not misusing it for the form of this world is passing away so what he is saying is that you know uh, he's saying time is short um you know you do have your uh, yeah you know if you're married and uh, you have your day to day responsibilities uh, time is short to and we need to you know s- serve the lord please the lord serve him and uh, and whatever the call is you need to you know pursue the call so time is short so don't get too engrossed or don't get caught up in the things of the world Okay, so if you are in the world, you, know, if you use the world. Of course, you know we, we use the world, meaning you know there are things that we engage with the world with regard to money, with regard to you know uh, domestic life and responsibilities. He's saying, yeah, we need to, we need to, but don't get too engrossed with the world. Uh, and he says, you know, because the form of the world, the external things, uh, the form uh, of the world is passing away. Okay, so let your focus, let your uh primary thing right be about pleasing the lord and serving him okay and uh, and then verse 35 says you know this i say for your own profit right this i say for uh, your edification rather you know this i, I I'm, i'm saying this um so that you will be benefited for your own benefit and uh, and not that i want to restrict you and put a leash on you in any way you know like uh, um the word that he uses there you know uh, uh like uh, uh for your own benefit or for your own uh profit so that it will be helpful to you is what he says and um, i don't want to put a uh, it's not to restrict you in any way okay it's not to put a leash on you uh, and uh, so that is the thing so that you might serve the lord without any distraction okay so this is the reason he is sharing this okay so it's it's good advice he is not uh, saying that um, in any way he is not downplaying marriage you know we know that because when we look at a lot of other scriptures ephesians 5 um, you know first timothy 4 uh, we see that like he is is first timothy 4 is actually talking about you know a group of people who are uh, um you know giving man man made wisdom 
right and also he is saying you know forbidding a lot of things you know forbidding to marry you should not marry if you don't marry then it's greater spirituality you know he's talking about those kind of people in first timothy 4 and he's saying you know these are teachings of demons right so these are not scriptural so you know that he's not uh, downplaying marriage he's not uh, in any way saying don't get married but he is actually talking about the reality of marriage the reality of responsibilities of marriage and he's saying let your focus be on the lord right and uh, you know uh, yes there there is the there are some real life challenges that are there and uh, you know responsibilities that are there he's bringing that out and then he's saying you know let your primary responsibility let it be towards the lord okay, so is just very clear about that we need to understand that right okay so then uh, from verse 36 till the end of the chapter um, let's read that now this is a slightly you know um, uh, especially this verse 36 uh, you know it's uh, it has kind of a uh, you know the context in which he says it uh, you know obviously uh, makes it uh, slightly complex to interpret it, right? Let's read it. 36, okay. But if any man thinks he is behaving improperly towards his virgin, if she is past the flower of youth, and thus it must be, let him do what he wishes. He does not sin, let them marry. Nevertheless, he who stands steadfast in his heart, having no necessity, but has power over his own will, and has so determined in his heart that he will keep his virgin, does well. So then, he who gives her in marriage does well, but he who does not give her in marriage does better. Okay, so verse thirty-six to thirty-eight. This this is what he says. So, so what is he saying? You know, so uh, like certain translations of the of the Bible, um, you know, translated uh, differently. You know, like there could be two, um, uh, let's say, two examples or two scenarios here. Okay, one is that this person here you know where he whom he is referring to is a father okay so is a father who has a daughter who is a virgin okay so and we know as in india and also you know in during those times biblical times the the parents and typically the father would take the responsibility of finding uh, a, a, a person for the daughter right to be married to um, so, uh, so that is what he is uh, referring to, uh, you know. So one one scenario is that maybe it's it's he's talking about the father, right? So he's saying, you know, let him do what he wishes. Let let, let them marry, you know. Let him give uh, the daughter in marriage. The other thing scenario is that maybe it's referring to a young person who is engaged to be married, who's considering marriage. You know, uh, uh, a, a, a woman whom he's engaged to, um, and uh, he's considering that. So it could refer to that. Why? Because it says that you know, uh, he who stands, uh, let's say, yeah, yeah, verse thirty-seven. He who stands steadfast in his heart, having no necessity, but has power over his own will, but has so determined in his heart, you know, uh, does well. He will keep his virgin, and and so on. So. It could be two scenarios, okay? So certain translations um, translate it that way, and uh, certain translations translate the second scenario. Um, but the uh, the NIV translation gives both, like in the Bible, in the uh, you know main uh, scripture portion, it translates the first, uh, sorry, the second scenario, I think, right? Uh, about uh, 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 let me just uh, check that. Okay. Uh, yeah, it's talking about in the scripture portion, it's talking about the um, second scenario of a person who is uh, engaged to be married. Okay. Whereas it also explains in the footnote about a father who has a virgin and whom he wants to give in marriage, right? Or is, uh, you know, maybe making a decision not to get her married. Okay. Two scenarios. Um, so, but whatever it is, right, uh, in either case, the fact is that uh, verse 38, he says, so he who gives her in marriage does better. He who does, does not give her also 
uh, is does sorry he who gives her in marriage does well but he who does not give her in marriage also does better so what he's saying in conclusion is that either way does not matter okay so either uh, you know decision is fine right if that is what you want uh, that's fine right if you if you choose to remain single that's fine if you choose to get married uh, that's fine so he's saying either way it it's okay right so that is how he concludes um, um, that particular instruction right verse 38 then verse 39 a uh, wife is bound by law as long as her husband lives but if her husband dies she is at liberty to be married to whom she wishes and only in the lord meaning that the other person also needs to be somebody, you know, a believer, right? So, um, so this is what uh, he says that you know this person is free. You can you can uh, to uh, if the husband dies or if the wife dies, you know, either way, right? The person is free to remarry, to marry again, and uh, and he says uh, she is at uh, freedom. She's at liberty to be married to whomever she wishes, only in the Lord. Um, was 40, but she is happier if she remains as she is, according to my judgment. And I think I also have the spirit of the Lord. So he's saying that, um, you know, uh, because of you know what he shared earlier, right? uh, uh, yes, there are, uh, you know, there are uh, responsibilities, there are priorities, and a person who's married you know, has certain priorities, which a person who's unmarried will not have. Okay. Um, so when, when it comes to serving the Lord, well, you need to take care of this as well as that. Right? You need to take care of domestic responsibilities and priorities, priorities to the, to the spouse, to the family. Right. You need to take care of that as well as, you know, what the Lord has interested you. In terms of ministry and so on, so uh, you need to take care of this and that. So he's saying that uh, uh, um, you know, she's happier if she remains as she is, as she is, according to my judgment. So he says, um, I also think I have the spirit of God. So with that, he ends the uh, chapter seven. Okay. Um, now, if, any questions? Any any questions based on what we saw? You know, uh, this is a slightly heavier topic, right? With regard to marriage, with regard to um, you know uh, domestic responsibilities, with regard to physical res uh, uh, relationships in marriage and so on. Um, so, any questions that you might have, or any clarifications that you might have, um, you can feel free to ask or anything that you want to add to whatever we shared just now. Any questions? Anyone? No questions? OK. Mm. So you, um, so you have clarity, you know, about uh, um, chapter seven, verse twenty. Let each one remain in the same calling in which he was called, and also verse twenty-four, brethren. Let each one remain with God in that state in which he was called. Okay, so so you understand in what what context he's calling. I mean, he's mentioning about the calling. And uh, and the state in which uh, one person is called to remain in that state, to remain in that calling, right? It is in the context of marriage. It is in the context context of even work or uh, you know uh, social uh, standing, right? Uh, he's talking about slave and freed men and so on, right? So you understand that, okay? Mm. And also this verse, right? Uh, verse 36, verse 37. Okay, so we need to understand that, okay, um, in the Greek, okay, um, uh, which uh, the King James and the New King James, um, you know, it just translates literally and then leaves it at that. 
Now, now they, it could be it could be referring to either the father or a young man who's engaged. So, but in either case, you know, we know that uh, this would be the application, right? If they do not married. If they are married, it's fine. If they are if they choose to remain unmarried, um, that's fine. Right? If the father gives in marriage, that's fine. If the father decides, okay, you know, um, not to, that's also fine. But of course, it's not a, it's it's not something that is forcing. You know, when it comes to father, um, parent child relationship, it's not something that the father is forcing on the child. Right? Uh, we know it it involves the free will of the uh, of the daughter as well. Right. So we know that. Okay. Um, so the important thing is also to understand in verse 35 you know, that um, the law, uh, Paul says that it is for your benefit, I say these uh, things, I, it's for your benefit that I give this instruction, this wisdom. And it's uh, it's not to put a leash on you, it's not to restrain you in any way. A leash typically is, uh, you know, like, suppose you take a dog out for a walk, uh, you know, put a leash, right, so that it... It uh, it prevents the dog from just running, right? It holds the dog uh, close to the master who's taking the dog for a walk, um, and uh, the dog does not have much freedom. It, it cannot run. It cannot you know go wherever it is. That's a leash, right? So he's saying, I'm not putting a leash on you. I'm not restricting your decision, restricting your choice, restricting your freedom in any way. I'm just giving you, you know, the reality of the situation. Right, so we, we we need to understand that also. Okay, fine. So let's. Uh, if there are no questions, no other thoughts, let's move on to uh, chapter eight. Okay, um, chapter eight is about uh, about idols, about eating food offered to idols. Okay, um, so that is uh, that is the topic of chapter eight, which he also addresses in chapter ten. Okay, so chapter eight is uh, one part of it. Uh, chapter ten is uh, the other part of. Uh, he continues with the uh, with the topic of uh, food offered to idols and worship of idols and so on. So, um, so this is one part of it. So when we when we when we get both the chapter eight and when we study you know chapter ten, then we get the full picture of uh, this whole topic of food offered to idols and what to do, what not to do, etc. Okay, so we are we are looking at one part of it. Um, so let's read. Right, um, uh, chapter eight. Now concerning food offered to idols. So he starts by saying, "Okay, now I've talked about all this. Um, now concerning the things of which you wrote to me, you know, that's how he starts verse uh, chapter seven, verse one. Um, then chapter ten, sorry, chapter seven, verse ten. He says, "Now to the married I command." And then verse twenty-five of chapter seven, he says, uh, "Now concerning virgins." And he gives the instructions. And so in chapter 8, he says, now concerning things offered to idols. Okay, so that is what he is going to be talking about. Okay, So chapter 8, verse 1, now concerning things offered to idols, we know that we all have knowledge. Knowledge puffs up, but love edifies. And if anyone thinks he knows anything, he knows nothing yet as he ought to know. But if anyone loves God, this one is known by him. Therefore, concerning things, the concerning the eating of things offered to idols, we know that an idol is nothing in the world and there is no other God but one. Okay, so, so he prefaces that before he goes into this. Things offered to idol, he's actually referring to uh, the things that are offered or food that is eating of the things that are offered to idols. Okay, so which is food, right? Food offered uh, and maybe consecrated or, or uh, you know, worship in an act of worship of the idols. That some food item, okay, something that someone can eat, right? So he's talking about that, referring to that, uh, obviously. So, but then he starts by saying concerning things offered to idols. Okay, so he says um, we know that um, we all have knowledge regarding this regarding this subject okay which means that he has probably taught about it and uh, maybe uh, when he was there um, now because the, the Corinthian culture is a idol worshiping culture right uh, so they 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 were uh, they had idols they worshiped idols they had 
uh, you know these temples um, and obviously they were uh, idol worshippers okay so when we say idols um we first of all we know that an idol could be something that is a physical image right a physical maybe like a statue or something it can also refer to something which is in our heart right in the sense something that we substitute for god it's something else that we substitute for god and maybe maybe you know you consider something of more value than god in your heart you know that can also be an idol right maybe uh, you know how you spend your time you know you don't consider spending time with god as something very important but spending time doing something else maybe you know entertainment or sport you know as more value than uh spending time with the lord you know maybe reading the word and so on and you're giving that more time that becomes an idol right that's a substitute uh for god in our lives right so that's uh, something is this in the heart right uh, internal but uh, paul here is obviously referring to physical idol idol worship of idol worship of images um that were or things you know statues image whatever was uh, we, that were offered or that were worshiped as gods okay so he's uh, very clearly referring to that and we know that uh, the corinthians were you know uh, had these temples and uh, you know when we when we study the thing they said they they were uh, uh, having the idol worship okay so um so so what he's uh, referring to is that um, saying okay with regard to this you might have knowledge or you might have understanding what you should do what you should not do okay now either uh, the, the thing could be maybe you are in the temple or in the vicinity of the temple and uh, you are offered something that is offered that has been offered to the idol okay someone offers it to you to eat and that is the typical thing scenario right you are in the vicinity or you are in the temple for whatever reason and this happens or it could be something that is sold uh, in the market and you know that okay it has been consecrated okay by uh, an act of worship to the idol it has been consecrated or blessed for blessings it has been offered to the idol and after that it is it is sold right in the market as food now um you know so that was also uh, done in the days of the uh, in uh, during those days in corinth right so th- these two possibilities were there uh, but then the, they were specially marked you know as these these were things that were offered to idols and then specially marked as that in, and sold in the market now um so paul is addressing that and he's saying that okay now maybe you kn- knew the truth okay now uh he's saying you know you have knowledge so you know the truth okay um but what is the thing he's saying that knowledge puffs up but love edifies okay so he's talking he's pointing to people who were who, who had the knowledge but who were looking down on others who are uh, you know who was looking down on others meaning that uh, looking putting down people and consider the others as inferior who uh, who did not have this knowledge okay or maybe who did not obey the truth about about this particular thing so so he's saying that knowledge puffs up but love edifies if anyone thinks he knows anything was to he knows nothing yet as you ought to know so he's saying that hey yes you might have this truth that you might and you might think that you know uh know this thing but then there are many other things that you don't know yet right and if you think you know i i know it i know everything that means that you you don't know yet you know there is there are so many things so don't be proud because of knowledge don't become proud because of knowledge and especially regarding this matter it is matter of things offered to idols uh, yes you know the truth now don't become proud and you know don't look down on others don't consider others as inferior okay and he says you know if anyone loves god this one is known by god now, that's the better thing 
you know to love god and to be known by god um if that's the uh, that's the right perspective right when you, whether you know the truth you know you, you you know the truth but the fact is that you love god and you are known by him you know that's that's important okay so he says love edifies love builds us up in the inner person there is spiritual progress you are built up on the inner man you know uh because of love okay and knowledge when you either you have knowledge or not you need to have love okay so which means that when you love god when you love god's people then you know then this attitude will not be there right this knowledge uh, even though you know the truth it will not puff you up because love would have edified you built you up and kept you humble okay so uh, verse 4 okay again he comes back therefore concerning the eating of things offered to idols we know that an idol is nothing in the world and that there is no other god but one okay so uh, but even if there are so called gods whether in heaven or on earth as there are many gods and many lords yet for us there is one god the father of whom are all things and we live for him and one lord jesus christ through whom are all things and through whom we live okay so um so what is he saying here he's saying you know i know that uh, again coming back to this thing of concerning things um, eating of things offered to idols we know that an idol is nothing in the world okay so so the thing is that okay here's an image here is a uh, you know here is an image here is a carving or whatever we know that there is it's nothing why because there is only one god there is only one true god and there is one lord jesus uh, for whom are all things you know we know this is the truth so this is actually nothing this idol is nothing okay it's it's uh, it's really you, you don't have to fear it you don't have to be afraid of it uh, or you know you don't have to uh, reverence it etc so you think an idol is nothing okay um okay so this is one part of it right so in chapter 10 he will talk about the other part of it so he says you know idol is nothing however there is not in everyone that knowledge for some with consciousness of the idol until now eat it as a thing offered to an idol and their conscience being weak is defiled so what is he saying is saying that you know there are some who don't have that kind of a knowledge you know that kind of a confidence uh that when they look at the idol you know they they don't look at it as you know there's that idol is nothing you know there's nothing to be feared feared uh, fear it there's nothing to you know reverence it uh because it's it's nothing we know that you know the ultimate reality and the all powerful god all knowing god is the god we worship so but not everyone has that understanding not everyone has that knowledge so when they look at an idol these people who do not have the understanding who do not have that knowledge he's talking about believers still consider an idol as something okay and if there is a situation where they are eating the food that is offered to idol then they consider it as something that is offered to the idol you know which means that idol is something and they are actually eating something that is offered to therefore they are what is happening their conscience is um, uh, they because they are uh, with that with this kind of con uh, you know consciousness or understanding since they are eating their conscience is weak and it's defiled okay so they are feeling guilty they are feeling condemned uh, it's their conscience is conscience is defiled okay verse 8 but food does not commend us to god nor you know for if we uh, neither if we eat are we the better nor if we do not eat are we the worse so he's saying food it does not draw us to god is not take us away from god okay so this food is not you know it's 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 not going to commend us to god or take us closer to god this idol is nothing okay so so he is making it very very clear now these things that are offered to the idols you know just by eating it it's it's just food 
now it's not going to you know commend us to god or take us away from god okay, because the reason is that idol is nothing right so that's the that's the understanding right this is nothing because there's only one true god so this idol is nothing so if uh, anyone eats this thing it's not going to affect him any way right so he makes it very clear in verse 8 um for if we do eat uh, nor if we do eat do not eat are we the worse verse 9 he gives the reason but beware okay but beware what is he saying? Be careful. Careful of what? You know. Okay. Now you are a person who knows the truth, who is very confident that yes, you know the under you have the understanding that there's only one true God, and uh, this idol is nothing. And somehow you you know you eat things offered to idol, and this person who um, who does not have this kind of an understanding sees you eating this right so that he's talking about that in verse 9 but beware lest somehow this liberty of yours this freedom of yours okay become a stumbling block to those who are weak now these are weak a weaker brother or a sister right a christian who is not strong a believer who is not mature maybe a person who has just come to know the lord and who still does not have clarity about these things, right? Someone who is he's saying someone who is weak. So, for don't become a stumbling block, don't become a barrier, or don't become a reason for someone to fall. A stumbling block refers to that, right? A stone or something which causes a person to stumble, trip on it, and fall. Okay, so figuratively, it means that. You're causing someone who's who's walk, uh, who's walking spiritually. You're causing that person to fall, or not causing progress in that person's spiritual life. Okay, so he's saying this freedom of yours. You know, you have the freedom. You have the confidence. You know, nothing will happen because food also. You know, it's just food, and uh, that it's, even though it's offered to idol, it's just nothing. And you have the freedom, not you know nothing will happen. But this freedom of yours, you know, be careful that this freedom causes someone else who is not as mature as you are, who is not as strong as you are, who is um, who is weaker than you, it causes them to stumble because for them they feel that idol is something. They feel that you know the food of his idol is actually an act of worship. They are made to stumble. Their faith is, uh, you know, is their, their or and their progress in spiritual life is halted, or, uh, you know, stopped because of your freedom, or the decision, or the choices that you make because of your freedom. Okay, so that's what he says. For um, if anyone sees you who have knowledge, verse ten. For if anyone sees you have knowledge, eating in an idol's temple. Okay, so you can look at this believer, strong believer. Maybe he's in the temple who's to share the gospel, whatever, you know. So if anyone sees you in the temple um, eating food offered to idols, right, in an idol's temple, will not the conscience of him who is weak be emboldened to eat those things offered to idols? So, you know, now, first of all, that person is weak, that person is not strong. And uh, will he not also think it's okay to do this? But then for him, it will be like an act of worship. He still is not strong. He still maybe fears the idol or he, he still, you know, fears that something, you know, he looks at food offered to idols as something, as food, you know, uh, uh, as an offering and, and something that will affect him, something that will, you know, bring something into his life, some good thing, into whatever, you know. So he will not, um, the conscious of him who was weak, be emboldened to eat those things offered to idol, and because of your knowledge, shall the weak brother perish. Okay, because of your knowledge and your freedom, are you going to cause a weaker brother, a weaker sister, to perish? You know, to cause them to sin and come to a place of you know perishing or death. Right. right? 
and uh, because of your knowledge shall the weaker brother perish for whom Christ died okay verse 11 okay so okay so we'll take a break and we'll come back uh, with the same topic okay we'll take a break now